Welcome, church, to the house of God. What a privilege it is to be able to worship freely. We ought to thank God and praise Him every day for that. And that's what our program our forefathers came to this country for, was freedom of religion. Today we're going to be remembering Jesus. We'll remember him in the taking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, his last supper. But more than these communion elements, we'll be remembering him as the one who is before all things and in him all things hold together. That's what it says in the word. Before all things and in him all things hold together. Put simply, he's above all else. We just sang that worship song and it glorifies Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is above all else. But it's hard for believers <laughs> to navigate that unknown territory where the only existing reality is God. I've written a book about this, The Fire in the Bush. And the main character in the book, Jacob Ruach, says this. In Christian cosmology, God is the initial state of the universe. Now don't get distressed. Too many of us say, that's over my head. Cosmology is the study of the whole of the universe as a system. It's big now in the science community. And the initial state is what was at the beginning the very reality of first things. God is the initial state. And when you take everything away, everything away, what's left? God. What this means is that before the cosmos, and before the atoms, and before matter, before the earth, before our solar system, before the Milky Way galaxy, before the universe itself, there was one thing, God. Is that too big for you? Too magnificent? It's hard for us to conceive of that. It's easy for believers to accept this without much thought. However, as we think about it, it requires biblical faith that jumps over our doubt. Please remember Hebrews 11.1. 1. Think for a minute. Some of you know it. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. That's where God is. Now most of us believers don't spend a lot of time or prayer in going over the initial state of the universe. I understand that. Nor for that matter, thinking about God as that beginning. Yet, when you read Isaiah and you hear what he says speaking for God, you have to wonder. These are the words that he writes. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I will not remember your sins. I will not remember your sins. 
Put me in remembrance. You know, we must have more than a, an appreciation for God. We need to have an awe of God. That's surprised, amazed, and humble reaction to who he is. And that's what drives us to our knees. When was the last time you were on your knees before God? But that's where worship is headed. To worship God. To care about Him. To be inspired and awed by His magnificence and by the power of the creation around us. We're on our way. But too many of us stop off for life issues. Or we let circumstances consume our thinking and our time. Or for the selfness we give ourselves over to our own thoughts and our own ways. God doesn't begrudge us this. He knows we're human beings. But at some point in our lives, there needs to be a moment of worship. Because he's above all. He's greater than us. He's greater than our problems. He's greater than anything that might happen. And he's greater than every word that the experts and authorities in our society lay out before us. He's greater than the presidential election in 2024. Amen. Isaiah was a Hebrew aristocrat. And he took his term serving in the temple. And he meets God in the temple. And he says, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What would you say, saints, if you met God? What would you do? And the way we answer that question is our state of worship. We're not talking about being religious or holy. We're talking about a state of mind of worship. The scripture says that we are to pray without ceasing. We're to worship without ceasing. And some of you, when you drive down the highway, I know that you're touched by the magnificence of the creation. This is those before us. And you may even say upon your lips, Praise God for this beautiful day. Praise God for the trees. Praise God that I'm able to think, that I'm able to live, that I'm able to work. That's worship. And it needs to be part and parcel to our lives as believers. God did not leave us as orphans. He did not leave us as persons to struggle to try and know who we are or what's going on. He simply said to us, come on to me. All you are worry and heavy laden. And what did he say? I will give you rest. Amen. Some of you will remember Michael Card. He's written a number of spiritual choruses. He wrote El Shaddai. He also wrote that's what faith must be. And Card was wrestling with his faith and with the identity of God. And he writes these words in a chorus. To hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see. That's what faith must be. Card struggles with this as we do. How can I know God? How can I worship him who I cannot touch and I cannot see? Jesus said to Philip something very important. He said, 
He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Well, you may say, but we haven't seen Jesus either, Pastor. How can we know the Father? What about the eyes of your heart? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. You've seen Jesus. You've seen him in your faith and in your commitment. And you've known him. Why do we trouble? He's above all else. How else can it be said? He's above all else. I remember hiking down into the bottom of Big Dahunga Canyon in the Angeles National Forest near where I lived growing up there in California. I was 18 and I had been dating Margaret Hefner. The girl from church who I had known since we were children. I was alone there in the canyon bottom. I was sitting on a rock beside the trickle of a creek and I prayed that God would help me to know if Margaret was to be my wife. There was a strange airborne buzzing. I still remember it vividly. And then there was the still small voice of God that came into my mind and my heart and said, yes, she will be. Was that my imagination? No. All of us have been touched by the presence of God, especially when we pray to him. Lord, what am I to do? Who am I, where am I to go? How am I to be? Who am I to meet? We pray these prayers and he answers them. And yes, in the stress of the day, we often fall off the trail because we're human. But he's above all. He's above all of that. He's greater than all that. Such is the mighty, mysterious, wonderful presence of God, which this, the Bible tells us surpasses all understanding. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Leon, Adonai, Age to age, you're still the same by the power of your name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Can you hear God is so near? That, that, that's what he said to, to Abram. He said, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. He said, walk before me and be blameless. In our worship, we become blameless, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what God Almighty has done for us through Jesus Christ. Saints, do you understand that? Do you receive that? Do you understand what a tremendous privilege and wonderful Know what it is. And when we lift up God's name and give praise and honor and glory to him, we open up a relationship that's supernatural. In our worship, we come into agreement and harmony with God's divine intention that mankind should be saved 
Isn't that what he says in the scripture? It's God's divine intention that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So it is that we, by the mercies of God, present our bodies as sacrifices acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. The worship of God stands above all else. Be amazed by the scripture. King, King Jehoshaphat led a group of worshipers into battle in front of the Israelite army to praise the Lord and sing, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. And confusion then reigned over the Canaanite armies. And God gave the people Israel the victory because they worshiped God. And when Ezra opened the book of the law, in the presence of all the people, and he blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. When was the last time we did that? And the text says the people were weeping. And Nehemiah said to the people, don't be mourning and grieving. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. 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 That lives in us. He who is above all has given us every privilege under heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the good news that we don't have to mourn anymore or suffer in our sinfulness because Jesus has taken our sins away. And it's all we have to do is to believe it and receive it. Oh, but how hard that is. How hard it is to believe in the God who is above all, who has come personally in Jesus Christ to take away our sins and to bless us when the world is dumping on us. I hesitate to admit that in my ancestry with the Brown family, we have a bad temper and anger is part of our life. You don't know that about me. None of you have seen me really angry, but I'm not pretty when I'm angry. <laughs> and I forget that he's above all. I forget that God has called me that he has redeemed me, that he has brought me to a safe place and life eternal through him. And what about you? Let's not get cornered by the world. Let's not be confused. The Bible says confusion is not of God. That's of the evil one. The worship of God stands above all else. And what about those wise men who came into the house and saw the child and Mary, his mother, and what did they do? They fell down and worshiped. And after Jesus walked in the water and rescued Peter from drowning, Jesus got into the boat and they were all amazed. And what did they do? They worshiped him. It's worship, saints. It's what God wants. Because my Bible says God dwells in the praises of his people. You know, the praise of God is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. Praising God means speaking how wonderful and great he is in adulation. Have you done that in church today? It's speaking our love for him. Have you done that in church today? It's speaking of his mighty deeds and his great mercy. 
Have you done that in church today? It's lifting our hands in sweet surrender to his name because he is above all. And we praise him and glorify him because that's what he wants. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, pastor, it's not sociably acceptable for us to be overt like that. It's not good for us to <coughs> be too visible. And, and, and I, I'm nervous and I feel uncomfortable about raising my hands, about praising God. Do you see what's happening to us? The Bible is very clear. Worshiping God is right up there in the highest of our priorities. Wherever we are and whatever we're doing. But we don't do it because the world is too much with us. That's what the poet said. The world is too much with us getting and spending. We lay waste our powers. Isn't it time that we start worshiping? Maybe it's just under your breath. Do you know when we sing these choruses? I don't know about you, but during the choruses, I'm saying, praise God, blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord, hallelujah, glory to you. It's not just singing a chorus, it's living it. It's, it's living in that worship. It's rejoicing in that. Oh, can't we see that a religion is nothing compared to the one that it's trying to meet? On that wall over there, it says, in the beginning, God. What does it mean? He is the one true being. He is the energetic personality of the universe. He is the initial state who was before all things. He is the light that fills the whole of reality. He is the savior of the world. <laughs> Paul told the Greeks, and we're Greeks, there in their special place of learning, he reminded them about the unknown God. Paul said, for in him we live and move and have our being. Preachers have been preaching it for 20 centuries. People have been receiving Christ and coming to saving faith. But at the same time, the world is going to rack and ruin because they do not believe. They do not commit their faith to the one who is above all. They commit their faith to the government, to science, to the economy, to political figures. When are we going to understand that the life is with God? who created all this, and turn to him and seek his face. Now some of you may be thinking, well, Pastor Tom, we know you're a pastor and you're supposed to say those things. You may be thinking that, and you may be thinking, but it's not for me. What is for you? What do you want out of life? If I were to say to each one of you, and we took you in a room, and we gave a prophecy over you, and we said to you, Joe Dokes, you got two months to live. But I feel fine, I'm healthy, everything's okay. In two months you're gonna drop dead of a heart attack. Would you live your life differently? We're all terminal. And the question is, where you're going. Jesus who's above all, God who's above all, has told us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but through me. When we believe that and we commit ourselves to that, it doesn't matter what happens to us because we're worshiping. Thank you, Lord. 
Margaret's uncle, Phil, whose home in heaven was an Assembly of God pastor. And I remember vividly when we go and visit. And Uncle Phil, we were out fishing one time. And Uncle Phil was fishing and he was saying, Bless God. Hallelujah. Bless God. Hallelujah. Are you blessing God? Should we bless God? Of course. When Jesus got in the boat, after they saw the miracle of him walking on the water, they worshipped him. He is worthy of our praise. We could and probably do appear drunk to the world when we raise our hands and when we enter into worship and we sing and we, we glorify God and bless his holy name. They thought those at Pentecost were drunk also. Oh, we are so careful not to go overboard in worship. It's like my dad told me when I was growing up. Keep your hands in your pockets. I don't want you moving around, you know. That's what we do when we worship. We, so many of us, put our hands in our pockets. I'm not saying that we have to be religious crazy. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be nice if we recognized who we're worshiping and give him the glory he deserves. Where's your faith taking you? Is it taking you into a deeper relationship with God? Or is it taking you deeper into your religion? Are you becoming a better Roman Catholic? or a better Baptist, or a better Methodist, or a better Presbyterian, or a better Pentecostal? Or are you becoming a better Christizer who believes in Jesus? The Lord's half-brother James writes this. He says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. You say, well, pastor, I don't know how to draw near to God. Have you tried praying? Have you tried reading the scripture? You're in church. God bless you for being in church. You're drawing near to God. Would it hurt to quietly from your soul and your very lips say, praise God, bless God? Holy art thou, Father. Thank you for what you've done. That's worship. We're going to be remembering Jesus. <laughs> but it's not the elements that we remember the bread and the fruit of the vine. It's him. Who is above all. Thank you, O oh Lord, for giving us the avenue of worship for calling upon our hearts and minds, turn to you. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name.